Hello everyone, my name is Pranav Loyalka. Uh, my presentation today is going to be titled To Clip or Not to Clip, the Latest Treatments in Valvular Regurgitation. With that, let's get started. So the first valve that we're going to talk about is the mitral valve, and that's where most of the work has come as far as valvular regurgitation for percutaneous therapies. This is a field that actually started l quite a while ago um, where you know, really surgically, uh, the first mitral commissurotomy was performed uh, back in 1902, and really the first percutaneous therapy was in 1982 with a percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty, which uh, you see there on your right. And then it was quite a few years until 2015 or 14, where the FDA approved the mitral clip for uh, degenerative mitral insufficiency, followed by approval for functional mitral regurgitation. So let's talk a little bit about percutaneous mitral repair, and we're going to first focus on leaflet repair. And with leaflet repair, I want to give a little bit of background as far as mitral insufficiency. We know that uh, with age, structural heart disease, particularly after the mid-50s, increases quite a bit in the population, and mitral valve disease is the majority of that. There are two classifications of mitral insufficiency to keep in mind. One is uh, what we call primary mitral insufficiency, which is really an abnormality of the leaflets. And the second type of mitral insufficiency is that related to the annulus or secondary mitral insufficiency. So you can think of it as a valve problem or a ventricle problem. If you look at secondary mitral insufficiency, patients do poorly if they have mitral insufficiency, all comers. And it increases the risk of death twofold um, in the population. With secondary mitral insufficiency, severity is also in equals increased mortality, as you can see on the graphs. And unfortunately, it's a largely untreated population. In 2009, if you look at the U.S. population, there were approximately 4.1 million patients with mitral insufficiency. There were 1.7 million that needed treatment. In other words, they had moderate to severe mitral insufficiency or more. And there were about 250,000 new cases per year. But mitral valve surgery only covers 30,000 patients. So there's a large unmet need. So obviously, mitral insufficiency and heart failure go hand in hand. And you can see the percentages there on the screen. And moderate to severe MR is present in approximately 40% of these patients. That's 5 million people with heart failure in the US. So the first system that we we're going to talk about is the mitral clip system, which was approved in 2014, as we noted, and then in 2019 for functional mitral insufficiency. Here's the FDA labeling uh, for the mitral clip, and also the AHA ACC guidelines for primary mitral insufficiency. The first trial I'd like to talk about is the COAP trial. This is the one that uh, got FDA approval for uh, primary, I'm sorry, for secondary mitral insufficiency. This was a trial that we were a part of that had over 600 patients enrolled. We randomized those patients um, who had severe mitral insufficiency um, due to uh, annular dilatation that were not uh, surgical candidates to either mitral clip with good medical therapy or uh, those just with what we call guideline-directed medical therapy. And the results were remarkable. If you look at the primary effectiveness endpoint um, and cumulative endpoint, you can see uh, there's a huge difference, almost 68% versus 36% between the two groups. And if you look at all-cause mortality at two years, there's a, almost a 17% gap between the arm that got treated with the mitral clip. This led to the FDA approval um, of the mitral clip system. And in the trial, uh, what, was all in, what was also impressive, it spanned almost every category um, in the trial. 
So with that, um, after patients have been uh, optimized on guideline-directed medical therapy, MitroClip is really the standard of care um, when the patient continues to have moderate to severe or severe mitral insufficiency. So I'm going to show a case um, that's fairly typical um, of the uh, MitroClip system. Um, this was a 53-year-old gentleman who had uh, severe um, degenerative mitral insufficiency, had previous three-vessel bypass surgery with a low ejection fraction. Um, and you can see the mitral insufficiency, quite severe. This is his hemodynamics with, with a very large V wave uh, above 50 millimeters of mercury. The ventricular function is poor. And during the time of procedure, we like to utilize four-dimensional echocardiography. Uh, this has really helped um, in all of our percutaneous procedures. The better we can see it, the easier it is to fix. This is how we place the mitral clip. We line it up with the A2, P2 uh, cusps, grasp the leaflets and close the clip, leaving mild mitral insufficiency. The hemodynamic improvement is almost immediate with a drop uh, in the V wave and near normalization of pressures. We can do this also for the tricuspid valve. We started doing this <coughs> off-label initially However, the FDA now has several trials, which we'll talk about, that uh, allow enrollment uh, for tricuspid clipping as well. So there are other FDA-approved devices now for mitral uh, insufficiency. Uh, this one was approved in the past year, which is the Pascal device uh, released by Edwards Life Sciences. Uh, this recently uh, received approval for degenerative mitral regurgitation. Uh, the device is slightly different than the mitral clip in that the uh, primary device has a spacer in the middle, uh, which allows uh, a larger tissue uh, mass to be grasped and closed on. Uh, it's still undergoing trials for functional mitral regurgitation. There is another device that is quite promising uh, in this space that uh, hasn't started trials yet, but should in the next uh, year or two. This is uh, called the Carlin device. Uh, it is really what's called a leaflet enhancer. I think the best way to think about this device is it's like an add-on uh, leaflet. So it's a leaflet extension. Um, so in those patients who have primary mitral insufficiency, this extends the tip of the leaflets to make them longer and improve the coaptation. The benefit of this device is that if you need to do a mitral valve replacement percutaneously, uh, there's no clip in the middle of the valve. There are a lot of other uh, mitral repair devices, um, and you can see they all work on different mechanisms, and I've list, listed a few. I think one of the ones that deserves some uh, mention is a cordal repair device by Neocord. Um, that is a percutaneous uh, Neocord uh, device that should be uh, on trial in the next year or two as well. As far as um, Repair. Also, there is uh, the harpoon device, which is undergoing trials, but this is more a hybrid procedure with surgery and cardiology. Uh, there's also indirect annuloplasty, which has been tried in the past. Uh, this is an anchor, uh, uh, the Monarch device, which used to be used uh, in trial in the great cardiac vein. However, it didn't pan out as the cardiac sinus really doesn't approximate the mitral annulus and uh, most people have abandoned trials in this space. As far as direct annuloplasty, there's a device called a CardioBand, which was in research trials, which we were a part of. It's currently being used in Europe. <clears throat> it is a percutaneous incomplete mitral ring, which is uh, percutaneously cinched down. Um, the device is uh, being reiterated uh, for um, expanded U.S. trials, hopefully again in the next year to, or two. 
Mitral replacement uh, space is uh, quite extensive. Uh, there have been many devices that have come and gone. Um, currently, there is no FDA-approved mitral valve replacement other than the Edwards aortic valve, which is indicated for uh, previous mitral surgical replacement or a previous surgical mitral ring. For native leaflets, uh, we're still on trial. And you can see there are quite a few trials that are ongoing, uh, but none have received uh, FDA approval. Part of the problem with the mitral valve prosthesis percutaneous is the anchoring mechanisms. <clears throat> if you look, there are different ways to anchor the uh, valve, unlike the aortic valve where you have a, a rigid annulus for aortic stenosis. There are different mechanisms uh, that are potentially available for anchoring on the mitral leaflets. They all have their uh, pluses and minuses. Other limitations really is you know, going transeptal versus transapical. Transapical allows you to align better. Transeptal is less invasive. Also, alignment uh, with the valves are very important. The more uh, coaxial you can be with a valve, the easier it is to place. Um, and many times on most of these devices, that is the greatest difficulty. The other great difficulty is visualization. We've really made steps forward with 4D echocardiography, the use of pre-planning with CT. Um, I expect this will get better as the echo technology also gets better. And certainly calcification can play a role in making these cases difficult as well. One of the uh, trials that is currently ongoing that we're a part of is the Sapien M3, our encircle trial. This was the first implant that was reported uh, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, I do have a few films. This utilizes a novel uh, anchor mechanism that goes around the native mitral valve. So uh, on the A subscreen that you see up there, there is a device that wraps around the mitral apparatus in the subvalvular space. That's actually the anchoring ring for the valve. Once the anchoring rings in, you inflate a transcatheter aortic valve that's been modified, and that actually keeps the valve in place. It's quite a clever technology. We've implanted several of these. Um, and really look forward to seeing where this technology goes. And these are some of the pictures, as you can see. It's a very nice deployment in those patients who are candidates for this valve. And I think that really brings up one of the other issues with uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Um, looking at the space where we are right now, I think uh, there won't be one device that fits all. I think uh, depending on the pathophysiology, there will be different devices uh, in this space. There are other uh, ongoing trials that I've uh, briefly uh, listed here for CLIP trials um, or replacement trials. Um, one of the other trials that uh, has finished enrollment is called the TRISEN trial. Interestingly, this is for the tricuspid valve. It's a percutaneous replacement. Um, we are awaiting the one-year data now from this trial and are in continuing access, um, but it is a percutaneous tricuspid replacement. Um, there's an expectation that it may get FDA uh, approval in a year's time. For aortic regurgitation, that's the forgotten valve that not many people speak about. Uh, there are a couple devices um, that have been tried. One is the J-valve, which is a Chinese um, manufactured valve uh, that is mix met with mixed success in the literature. It is not FDA approved. This is a Jenna valve that uh, I've uh, shown here. This is in U.S. trials currently. Thank you.